Redditors who left companies that nonstop talk about their amazing culture. What was a cringe moment that made you realize you had to get out? Story one, bought out by an equity group. The new president on a call with thousands of employees says, we have two kinds of employees, those that work a tremendous number of hours and those that should find another company to work for. Story two, this is what the woman who interviewed me said. Here at Cheapskate Architects, we don't often do all-nighters for our customers, but when we do, it's a real pizza party. Also, we don't pay overtime. We do it for love. And your wage is $22,000 even though you are an architect. And also, I won't be there because I'm in HR management because I'm married to the director. Yes, we need an HR department even though there are only three employees. Story 3. When I went to a firm drinks in a public bar, the firm's fun committee handed out song sheets and a choir of employees led by a bad guitarist sang a song about how great the firm was to the tune of Cause I'm Happy. We were expected to sing along. It was at that moment that I realized I was in a cult. Story 4. Not my company, but a company from a neighboring building. They had an entire area devoted to foosball, pinball, billiards, console gaming, and video key booths on the ground floor, and it was clearly visible because of the glass windows on street level. Oddly enough, nobody ever used them, and the place was almost always empty, save for a few people who used the internet kiosks. When I learned about a friend who worked there, I asked why nobody would want to take the opportunity to use the awesome-looking recreational facility. He told me that people who do use the facility often find it used against them during performance evaluations, even when their use wasn't excessive at all. After a while, word got around and they started avoiding the place altogether. The irony is that the recruitment ads always tout a culture of work hard, play hard. Story 5. Not me, but my husband worked for two weeks for a family-owned and operated business that touted how important family was and that they were all one happy family. My husband was on his way to drop our two-year-old son off at daycare before work when his son threw up all over himself. The husband called his employer to tell them what happened and that he needed to take his son home and clean him up, but he'd be in ASAP. His manager told him he needed to get his priorities straight. He responded, you know what? You're right. I won't be back in at all. He was still working part-time at his previous job where they had been sad that he was leaving. So he called them and told them to put him back on the schedule full-time. The family business is currently in the process of liquidating assets before going out of business, and I cackle every time I drive past it. Story 6. When our university's VP explained that the goal of every tenured faculty member was to write enough grants to pay our salaries and replace us with teacher assistants. Every semester, ideally every undergrad class. Also, we'd be under a hiring freeze but could feel free to be creative and use temporary grant money to hire tenured faculty. Also, we'd all be paying an extra $250 per year in parking fees to fund a new student parking lot. Dear Lord, was I glad I'd already decided to leave? I cannot identify the state university system in question. It suggests that it's not alone in its approach. If you're looking for a good college to attend, ask plenty of questions. And for the love of God, ask about accreditation and do not take we're finalizing right now as an answer, nor we're accredited by the three other colleges we're co-scamming with. If you're more specifically concerned about the problem I describe, ask probing questions about the percentage of classes taught by full-time faculty and grab copies of the course catalog and campus directory faculty list to check the reality of offerings. I would also ask about advising. Colleges without advising staff offload that duty onto professors, and that can make it very difficult to get your advisor's attention. Story 7. My last job was at an independent school in the UK. You know, the wealthy type. During a period of streamlining, the entire faculty was called into a hall and told in upbeat terms that we were struggling to make ends meet. Salaries were too high, perks were too abundant, and spending was unsustainable. For clarity, salaries weren't too high and perks were practically non-existent. Spending was definitely unsustainable, however, in part because they were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars redesigning the senior staff offices to hide all the cabling and install proper wood paneling. So then they started listing off perks and assigning them a value. For example, free parking. Well, the school has a lot of land and isn't in a city. Why would you charge? Secondly, nice surroundings. Well, again, no shot. That's part of your marketing appeal. Long holidays? Nice try, but I work all holidays. They didn't even get as far as telling me what they plan to do with my job and pay. I was gone in less than three months. Story 8. We, the management team, spent months working with a business coach trying to collectively come up with meaningful core values. We devoted a ton of time to it and really decided, tried to decide at least, which direction we wanted to take the company's culture. 
Everybody agreed on teamwork, reliability, and a couple of others that I can't remember right now. And then one day, the owner came in and called a meeting. He sat us down in the boardroom and told us he had spent all weekend brainstorming and had decided on the core values. They were meaningful ownership, neighborhood, engagement, you. Does anybody see what that spells? He literally wanted it to be money and just came up with words that sort of work the way you do in elementary school when writing your name poem. He rebranded the entire company from t-shirts with giant first letters and smaller letters for the rest of the words straight down the arms to plaques, wraps on the cars, everything. And that's when we all knew it was going to get worse. Money is great, but it was mortifying walking or driving around with that plastered everywhere. Story 9. When attending a management retreat, I was pressured into buying a charity raffle ticket I couldn't afford. $20. The two people who won before me donated their winnings to the same charity they bought the raffle tickets from. They were middle management, pissed at people who make $100,000. I make $32,000 with a young daughter. I won a drawing for $400. I literally had nausea for two days trying to figure out how I was going to pay my bills after my job had just moved the goalposts on some sales performance bonuses I had coming my way, dropping them effectively from $1,000 to just $200. Now I'm the one who's going to keep the money I won. I guess I'm not a team player. Bonus, this was a four-hour drive from home. We had an overnight stay and one of those middle management messes in an example of what should be on or off the clock said we shouldn't be paid for the drive to the retreat. Screw you. I was on the clock from the time I left Friday until I got home Sunday. If you're forcing me to be somewhere as part of my job, it's all on the clock. My district manager didn't like that and I was already looking for the door. Story 10. Pizza Hut. Where will Pizza Hut take you? During the interview, I was told, the work is hard, but we feel like a family and we can always rant about the bad customers after a shift. And the people there were horrible. The managers made you do two people's jobs for less money. I was paid the minimum wage for my age, $4 an hour, and the company purposely brought on 16-year-olds for that reason. I was told that they didn't have enough money to pay me, so my shift was canceled. I was told I'd be paid to complete my training, but I wasn't. Our manager would fling the corks of Prosecco bottles at the waitresses to make them scared and there would be regular breakdowns between cooks and waiters. I would regularly get screamed at in front of the whole restaurant for silly things like the knives and forks not being straight enough, even though they would leave me by myself as in I was the only waiter still working one week after my first shift. The waitresses would always rant about the other people in the restaurant and would shout at me for asking questions, even on my first day. At one point, an outside chef was brought in from a different restaurant, and he didn't realize he had a wash-up cutlery because he didn't have to at his old place, and that's an entirely separate job. So we ran out of cutlery and the two more experienced waitresses, instead of helping me in washing up the cutlery or teaching me how to do it myself, would just hoard the cutlery so it was me that would run out and then my manager would have another go at me. Screw that place. Story 11. My last job was for a large cinema chain and the incentives for working there were free movies and a great culture with colleagues. This seemed great on paper. There were five pillars of the company, a newish thing since they were bought out, one of which was fun. I worked at one of the largest branches of the company with 50 or so employees at the time. Every morning before we opened the doors, the managers made us huddle together like a football team and gave us our morning pep talk. All right, guys, listen up. Today is going to be great. We've got the new X movie and whoever sells the most of the Y promotional item gets a free soda drink. Woo! Go, go, go. It's going to be amazing. Can you top this week's record for best reviews? Whoever gets the best reviews today gets free popcorn. Whoa. Man, I hated it so much. No one cared, but they preached this speech at the beginning of every shift change, despite every single employee being completely deadpan. It was like a school care worker trying to get adults to play with bricks and build the tallest tower. Awful. Story 12. When I was asked to sleep with a potential client, At the time, I was in my early 20s. I'm a female. Looking back, I realized I had more going on looks-wise than I knew back then. This was decades ago. My boss, the business owner, always told us that he thought of the office as one big family. He also referred to the female employees as his girls. A new client is coming into the office. My boss called me into his office and told me he was going to give me the company credit card so I could take the potential new client out for dinner and drinks. He told me to sleep with him. We need this client if everyone wants to get paid. I said, at pressure. I said no, and the next day I quit. A couple of months earlier, my boss had invited me over to his house for dinner with his family and a swim in his pool because he said he knew how hard I had been working. 
Now, I was a little surprised that he finally noticed and thought it was kind that he wanted to do something nice for me. So I get there and his wife and kids are gone, but there is a 25-year-old guy in his pool, the son of a client who just got out of the army. He told me he was trying to fix me up on a date because I needed to get out more. Like an idiot, I believed him. It wasn't until later that I realized he was hoping I'd somehow show more interest in the guy. I found out later that he had asked all the female employees at one point to sleep with clients. The secretary actually did. She was a young, single mom and was worried she'd be fired if she said no. After I quit, she told me she wished she had done the option to quit. I didn't realize what she was saying until we talked later. At the time, his daughter was around four years old. When I quit, I asked him how old his daughter would have to be before he asked her to sleep with clients. I thought he was going to hit me. I have a thousand stories about working at this place. The guy was an unethical idiot, a dangerous combination, but I learned a lot about how not to run a business from him. I've now owned my own business for 30 years now. I've never asked an employee to sleep with clients or even go out for drinks. I had the benefit of growing up in a family with money. I wasn't earning much and would probably not have been able to quit and move without the assistance of my parents. I never told them what happened. When I told my dad I was quitting, he was happy. You hated that place. Now that I'm older and times have changed, I know what to do. I would hope he'd face consequences. Today, this isn't considered a regular part of the business. The hashtag MeToo movement wasn't a thing back then, and no one really cared. This was the only time I was directly asked to sleep with a client, but it is not the only time I face harassment at work. It was so common for me and my friends that when we pushed back against it, we felt like we were really on the leading edge of changing work environments for women. I guess we were, but it's sad that we needed to be. I certainly hope women didn't face this anymore, but the recent news set me straight on that. Story 13. My boss came up with a campaign called Smoovers, like smile and move, and we needed to be Smoovers and encourage other associates to be happier that they worked for a dead-end retail corporate job. He gave us bracelets to wear and little cards to keep on us at all times. We worked at a timeshare property with owners who owned part of a small independent timeshare in the early 2000s that was bought out by a huge hotel conglomerate that destroyed the entire aesthetic of what they originally invested in. These were embittered, hateful people, always wanting refunds for silly stuff like a broken treadmill in the gym. I literally had a grown-ass man, followed by his wife an hour later, yelling, raising voices in the lobby at my young, visibly pregnant self because a lifeguard moved their towel from their beach chair after they left for two hours to take a nap in their room on the 4th of July while we're all at full capacity. On top of the daily emails reminding us that working for Wyndham was the best choice we'd ever made in life and constant reminders from upper management what our mission in life, your life purpose, the reason you were born was, to reason on a daily basis with unreasonable garbage humans as hard as you can until they give us a five on their surveys, I declined all requests for transfers and just got out as fast as I could. Story 14. I was seen as the poor kid in the group because I hadn't been able to buy $600 worth of tools the first month. In my first and only review, it went something like this. Manager. Okay, you haven't been able to afford the required toolkit, so that's worked out against your performance review. Also, you need to improve me. Uh, okay, what do you mean by improve? Manager, you just, uh, need to improve. Me? Okay, I get that I need to improve, but like, what specifically is an example of that? Manager, we've tried pairing you with a variety of texts and they agree you need to improve. Me? Okay, name a recent job where I could have improved. Manager, the generic name, contract. Me? All right, what specifically about that contract could I have improved on? Can I have an example? Manager, you just need to improve. Now, I've already said that repeatedly now. You need to stop making me repeat myself. Me, oh, you're right. I agree. I think we need to stop. Stop working here. I'm out. Story 15. I'm in management, and we just got the message that bonuses for the last financial year were severely cut across the business, probably going to receive 30% of our total potential at best. Then we attended our financial end-of-year results meeting the next day to be told that net profits were 18% up, nearly $1 billion in total, and the best performance in years, all thanks to us. Okay, I'm planning on leaving now. Story 16. I was working for a financial firm with 1,800 employees and a sales force of 200. I was one of the salesmen. We had our annual meeting in April. It was a big affair. Most of the employees attended and the CEO gave a big speech about how the previous year was the best in the company's history, blah, blah, blah. The next month, May, we each submitted memos basically justifying why we qualified for or should qualify for bonuses at the end of June. 
I wrote mine out and explained the sales growth in my territory over the course of the previous 12 months and what percentage of my sales were out of last year's total sales. Coming off the company's best year ever, it should have been a slam dunk, right? All of us were excited about how much we'd have coming in June. So June rolls around and my bonus is zero. Zero. But it's not just me, it's all over the sales floor. Less than 20% of the sales force got bonuses and holy crap, everyone was pissed. All the supervisors were dealing with angry subordinates, the sales manager was too, and even the VP and director above him. Everyone was furious and insubordinate. Angry, accusatory emails were flying, and the company was facing a mutiny. It got worse when it came out that the supervisors were offered bonuses that they could determine for themselves. Most of them took them, but a couple, knowing their subordinates wouldn't be getting anything, refused. My supervisor took his, and when it came out, he tried to explain to his sales team how he felt it was justified and how hard he worked. He ended up with people screaming at him about how they felt the same, but they didn't get crap. So for a week or so, things on the floor came to a stop. A lot of people just didn't show up, and the ones that did were angry. I came in and started reading Monster.com ads at my desk. I also stopped selling anything or answering my phone. When confronted by my boss, I told him that as soon as I got the bonus, my sales justified, I'd start working again. Until then, I'd be coming in late, reading and responding to want ads and leaving early. He could expect me to keep that up until I found another job or was fired. The following day, I was sent to the regional sales manager's office. She said she'd heard about my work stoppage and asked me to explain myself. I told her that if she heard about it from my supervisor, then she already knew why I wasn't working and I didn't need to explain it again. She tried buddying up to me, being friendly, then being stern, then being angry. I kept my composure and told her that the longer the company held out on my bonus, the longer it was going to miss out on sales from my territory. I then gave her my average daily amount of sales from the previous year, quantified what the total loss would be for a week of me not selling, and how much cheaper it would be just to pay me the money I was owed and get me back to selling. Then I thanked her for her time and told her I'd be leaving work as soon as I left her office, and I did. The following day, I came in, checked my emails, some of which were farewell emails from coworkers who quit over their stolen bonuses and sat on Monster.com until I was told to go to the office of the national sales manager. Now, he's the gatekeeper. He's in charge of all 200 of us. He told me he understood that I was upset and could see why. I asked him if withholding the bonuses from 80% of his sales force was his idea or someone else's. He didn't answer. He told me that I would be getting a check on Monday, and could I please go back to work now? I told him I'd be going back to my desk, but work wouldn't start until the check was in my hand. When I went back and checked my emails, yep, more defections. The next day, an email went out to the entire sales force. Management had taken a look at the numbers, reevaluated the financials, and determined that June bonuses would be issued shortly. The email also apologized for the delay and reminded us that, as salesmen, we were the core of the company and our hard work was appreciated. I also received another email, this time from the national sales manager, who told me that while bonuses were scheduled for Monday, he'd be walking my check to my desk the following day. So the following day I showed up, sat down, and shortly afterward, the national sales manager walks up and hands me my bonus check. I thanked him and handed him my resignation, effective immediately. In my resignation letter, I requested that a check for my unused vacation time be cut and given to me before I left the building. When he finished reading it, I told him I'd clean out my desk while I waited for the vacation check. While I was doing that, one of my coworkers also resigned, effective immediately. We walked out at the same time and ended up getting drunk at the bar across the street. I learned later from coworkers that even though the company issued the bonuses, they lost about 20% of the sales force in the following two months. Gotta love corporate greed. Story 17. We had a problem with a client and the boss dumped all of the blame on a 24-year-old woman who was basically his most loyal employee. He made her cry in front of the client as if that would somehow help save the relationship. Story 18. A coworker was forced to work while her mother was dying in hospice. So her mom dies, she quits, and they escort her off the premises like a criminal. Story 19. Treat every dollar like it was your own. Yeah, huh? Right after we went well over targets for the entire year and then were told a Christmas party wasn't financially viable because expenses? It's one of the biggest hospitality groups in Australia, by the way. Story 20. Lush, when we couldn't say bathroom on the shop floor and instead had to ask a manager for serenity. <laughs> 